Hi guys, it's Harsul Facharya and I'm back again with yet another lecture on organophosphate poisoning. But as I said earlier, everything in medicine and surgery is derived from an application of basic sciences. And hence again, today, for the understanding of organophosphate poisoning, we would have a brief look into the basic science related to organophosphate and cholinergic system. Now, what is organophosphate? Organophosphate is basically a chemical compound that can irreversibly inhibit the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. Now, what is the role of acetylcholine esterase and how does its inhibition affect our body function? So acetylcholine esterase is basically an enzyme that's located at the synapse. At the synapse, the function of this enzyme is to break down acetylcholine into acetyl-CoA and choline. Now, this choline is subsequently recycled back to the presynaptic terminal for the synthesis of new acetylcholine. Hence, acetylcholine is responsible for a termination of cholinergic activity at the synapse. And this termination leads to a termination of cholinergic activity on the acetylcholine receptors that are located on the autonomic ganglia, the neuromuscular junction, and various viscera. Let's understand that with the help of a basic diagram. In this diagram, this is our presynaptic membrane, this is our synapse, and this is the postsynaptic membrane. The presynaptic membrane releases acetylcholine. This acetylcholine would then act on the postsynaptic membrane via the acetylcholine receptor. This acetylcholine is broken is broken down into acetyl-CoA and choline by acetylcholine esterase. And acetylcholine esterase is inhibited by organophosphates. So we can so now we understand that inhibition of acetylcholine esterase by organophosphate would lead to a lack of termination of cholinergic activity, leading to a persistent cholinergic activity on both nicotinic and muscarinic receptors, subsequently leading to its effects. Now let's understand the clinical features of this poisoning. But before we start the clinical features, how would a patient be exposed to organophosphate? Under what circumstances would you suspect organophosphate poisoning? So organophosphate can be toxic for our body, that is, it can be absorbed into the systemic circulation by any route. It can either be ingested or it can be inhaled or, then, or there may be a contact with large amount of organophosphate. So a patient may come to you saying that he has inhaled a large amount of fertilizer or it may be a suicidal attempt in which the patient has ingested a large amount of fertilizer, which is basically organophosphate. Now, now let's understand clinical features in the form of a small story. I have a farmer. He is spraying fertilizers in his, on his crops to protect them from the bugs. But while, for, but, but while spraying the fertilizer, he forgets to wear a mask. As a result of which, he inhales a large amount of organophosphate. And this organophosphate would then enter the systemic circulation, leading to inhibition of the acetylcholine esterase enzyme at the synapse. This inhibition would lead to an increased acetylcholine at the synapse with its increased activity on the nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. So now this acetylcholine would act on the nicotinic receptors, which are basically located on the autonomic ganglia and the neuromuscular junction. You can see here, organophosphate or basically acetylcholine acts on the nicotinic receptors and the muscarinic receptors. The nicotinic receptors are located on the autonomic ganglia and neuromuscular junction, whereas the muscarinic receptors are mainly located on the viscera. Now let's understand the clinical features that would occur due to a persistent stimulation of nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors are basically located at the neuromuscular junction. At the neuromuscular junction, initially they would bind to the acetylcholine receptor leading to sodium influx and a contract leading to sodium influx leading to depolarization of the muscle and plate with calcium influx leading to contraction of the muscle. But that's only the initial response. Gradually, as acetylcholine constantly binds with the receptors, this leads to a persistent activity on this receptor leading to desensitization of the acetylcholine receptor on the muscle and plate. And this desensitization would lead to no effect of acetylcholine on its receptor 
leading to a lack of development of action potential at the muscle end plate, leading to a lack of contraction of the muscle, which leads to muscle paralysis. And this muscle paralysis is basically a flaccid type of paralysis because spastic type of paralysis is basically seen in upper motor neurons where there is a lesion in the motor pathway above the anterior horn cell. I beg your pardon, it's upper motor neuron lesion in which you see the spastic type of paralysis. So my patient due to persistent activity on the nicotinic receptor would lead, would have a flaccid type of paralysis. And this paralysis would also include the muscles of respiration. My diaphragm and my accessory muscles of respiration would be paralyzed. As a result of which I hypoventilate leading to a decrease in my arterial PO2 with an increase in PCO2 which can be fatal. Along with this there would also be a paralysis of the muscles of tongue which would lead to falling back of the tongue thereby inability of the patient to maintain a clear airway. Now let's understand the action of acetylcholine on the muscarinic receptors. On the muscarinic receptors, let's go stepwise from head to toe. On, in the CNS, there are both nicotinic as well as muscarinic receptors. Due to stimulation of these receptors, you have an in, uh, these acetylcholine is basically an excitatory neurotransmitter in the CNS and stimulation of its receptors would lead to a state of CNS stimulation in which the patient can have seizures. So seizures is another life-threatening event that can occur in a patient of OP poisoning. Apart from that, he would have delirium, psychosis, hallucinations, and all the features of CNS excitement. On the eye, acetylcholine would act on sphincter pupillae. This action on the sphincter pupillae would lead to a subsequent contraction of sphincter pupillae, which would lead to meiosis, and my patient would have a pinpoint pupil. In which other poisoning do you see pinpoint pupil? Pinpoint pupil is also seen in morphine poisoning. So morphine poisoning and organophosphate poisoning are two poisoning in which you can see pinpoint pupil. After that, let's go to the nose and the mouth. The nose and mouth basically contain glands that secrete some amount of fluid and cholinergic receptors enhance the secretion. Hence, they would enhance the secretion in all parts of the body, including the nose and mouth, leading to rhinorrhea, salivation, sweating, etc. On the lungs, they would lead to a stimulation of the bronchial smooth muscle, leading to bronchoconstriction. This bronchoconstriction is responsible for a wheeze on lung auscultation, along with which they would also secre increase the secretion or uh, increase the uh, secretion in the lungs. This increase in pulmonary secretion, uh, secretion is responsible for crepitations on auscultation. So, on auscultating this patient, I would, on auscultating the lungs in this patient, I would hear creps and wheeze. On the CBS, stimulation of cholinergic receptors lead to bradycardia, a decreased heart rate and a decreased force of contraction. This would lead to a state of decreased cardiac output and a decrease in blood pressure mainly the systolic blood pressure. And this decrease in blood pressure is called hypotension. So I would have bradycardia accompanied with hypotension. The action on GID. On GID, like in other parts of body, it increases the secretion. Along with an increase in secretion, it also increases the gut motility. This increase in gut motility along with secretions lead to diarrhea. On the GUT, a stimulation, they would stimulate the detrusor muscle leading to its contraction along with relaxation of the sphincter and that will lead to an increased frequency of urination. Let's go stepwise. Um, on the eye, meiosis, on secretions would be increased. On the lungs, they would cause bronchoconstriction. In, on the CVS, there would be bradycardia and hypotension. GIT, increased motility and secretion leading to diarrhea. The GUT, contraction of the bladder along with relaxation of the sphincter leading to increased frequency of urination and CNS excitement along with action on nicotinic receptors leading to muscle paralysis due to desensitization of receptors due to persistent stimulation. Now how would I manage this patient? So I'm standing in the emergency department, a patient walks in with seizures, muscle paralysis, hyperventilation, diarrhea, increased frequency of urination, 
bradycardia, decreased blood pressure, and I immediately suspect OP poisoning. I asked the patient, I asked the relatives accompanying the patient as to how did this happen. They may give me a attempt of suicide or or an incident in which the patient was spraying pesticides in the field, etc. So I immediately suspect OP poisoning. As soon as I suspect OP poisoning, I would take a blood sample of this patient and send it to the laboratory to confirm my diagnosis. How would I confirm the diagnosis of OP poisoning? I would measure the plasma choline esterase activity. Sorry, I would measure the plasma choline esterase activity. If the plasma choline esterase activity is decreased by 50% below normal, my diagnosis of OP poisoning is confirmed. I can also measure the RBC choline esterase activity. Now, what about and now? How would I immediately manage this patient? Since this patient is at an emergency condition due to if immediate care is not given the patient may die i would follow the abc protocol in this patient abc protocol stands for first airway management followed by breathing management followed by circulation management so the airway management would basically include maintenance of a patent airway now in this patient my in this patient the airway is blocked due to the paralysis of the tongue muscle, basically genial glasses, leading to a falling back of the tongue. And this falling back of the tongue leads to airway obstruction. Hence, I would like to manage the airway by intubating. In intubation, I basically insert a tube, uh, an intubation tube through the mouth of the patient into the trachea, which, and thereby preventing the tongue from falling back and maintaining a patent airway. Next comes breathing. My, since my patient is hypoventilating, his PO2 would be low, his PCO2 would be high. And to compensate for this hypoventilation, I need to mechanically ventilate this patient. So an important aspect is mechanical ventilation, along with oxygen supplementation because my PO2 has decreased. So breathing would consist of mechanical ventilation along with oxygen supplementation. Next comes circulation. Since my patient is hypotensive, I would like to administer some amount of IV fluid. But not excessive IV fluid because that would cause a cardiac overload. The real, the real maintenance or the real management of circulation would be achieved by administration of atropine. What is atropine? Atropine is an antagonist of acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptors. Hence, antagonism with atropine would lead to reversal of all the actions mediated by the muscarinic receptor. This also includes the action on CVS. Hence, the bradycardia would be reversed with an increased heart rate, with an increased force of contraction of the heart and an increased cardiac output. That would also lead to management of my blood pressure, along with which there would be reversal of pinpoint pupil, there would be decreased secretion, there would be decreased sweating, I would get clear, clear lung fields on auscultation, diarrhea and urinary symptoms would also be managed. But what about now? What is the dose of atropine, and how do I monitor my patient on atropine? The dose of atropine is basically 1.8 to 3 milligram given intravenously. After I administer atropine, I observe the patient for five minutes for the signs of atropinization. If I haven't achieved it, I would double the dose that I had initially administered, along with double the time of observation, and I would continue doing this till I achieve the signs of atropinization. Now, what are the signs of atropinization? Atropinization is basically characterized by reversal of pinpoint pupil, clear lung fields on auscultation, that is no creps, no wheeze, a dry axilla due to decreased secretions, increase in systolic blood pressure above 90 mm of Hg, and increase in heart rate above 80 beats per minute. So if these five signs are present, I would say my patient is atropinized. If only one or two signs are present, I would not consider it as, as atropinization. Only if all five signs are present, I would consider my patient to be adequately atropinized. But atropin is an antagonist at the muscarinic receptors. It does not reverse the action on the nicotinic receptor. Hence, the muscle paralysis that was present Due to the action of acetylcholine on the nicotinic receptor is still present. My patient can still not manage his airway. My patient can still not breathe on his own. He would still be hypoventilating even after the administration of atropine. 
what would I do for that? I need to give a drug that can cause that can cause reactivation of the acetylcholine esterase that has been inhibited by organophosphate. And this magical drug is pralidoxime. Pralidoxime basically binds to the anionic site on the acetylcholine esterase, forming a bond with organophosphate. Subsequently, this acetyl subsequently this pralidoxime and organophosphate compound diffuses away from acetylcholine esterase, uh, reactivating this enzyme. But as I initially said, organophosphates are an irreversible, irreversible inhibitors of acetylcholine esterase. Hence, I need to uh, administer pralidoxime in the first 48 hours of poisoning. If I don't do so, my enzyme will undergo aging after which even pralidoxime cannot reverse the block. Hence, administration of pralidoxime in the first 48 hours is of paramount importance. If I don't do so, there is no point of administering pallidoxime and I need to mechanically ventilate and intubate my patient till new acetylcholine esterases are synthesized. So, but pallidoxime is very slow to act. It's not like atropine. Atropine acts quickly. Pallidoxime takes some time to activate. But till then, what do I do with my patient? If I administer pallidoxime and wait for it to act, my patient is still hyperventilating and he may die due to respiratory failure. Hence, I need to continue my intubation and mechanical ventilation. So intubation and mechanical ventilation are one of the most important steps of management of organophosphate poisoning. And if, the, if my patient has seizures, I would manage it with benzodiazepines. The dose of pralidoxime is a loading dose of 30 mg and a maintenance dose of 9 mg. And I usually continue it for 48 hours after I stop atropin. So this basically, so let's just have an overview of the management. The investigation would be plasma colon, colon esterase activity, which would decrease by 50% of normal. I would initially manage on the ABC protocol, which is A for intubate, B breathing, C IV fluids, atropin, and pyridoxan. Since pyridoxan causes reactivation of acetylcholine esterase, leading to uh, a reversal of the nicotinic and muscarinic symptoms, pyridoxan is my real antidote. So this concludes our lecture on organophosphate poisoning. But as we saw, an application of simple autonomic nervous system principles leads to a great understanding of organophosphate poisoning. Hence, I kindly recommend all of you to follow this protocol of study in which you apply basic science for understanding the medical and surgical topics. Don't try to mug them up or grasp them as it is. Apply the basic science, think of a physiology, and then think if this physiology is disrupted, what would happen? And that would give you all your answers. You would have your clinical features, you would have your investigation, and you would have the subsequent treatment. Uh, so I recommend all of you to follow this protocol of study and hope this lecture helps. Thank you very much.